This video is brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you wish to support the channel and allow me to dedicate more time to producing such videos, you can do so with a small monthly donation on patreon.com slash Balkan Odyssey. When someone says the word Balkan, these are probably some of the things that the average person would associate with this rather mystical part of the world. With the turn of the century, the fall of communism and the barbaric bloodshed of the Yugoslav wars, the area of southeastern Europe has steadily acquired a refined new identity, an image that was intensely developed and promoted as time went on. This very image has, through the expanding pop culture and internet meme culture, reached quite incredible notoriety, so that Balkan is nowadays, among natives and foreigners alike, the prime embodiment of oriental barbarism, craziness and hot temperament that is unique to this part of the world. The romanticization and simultaneous promotion of this carefully curated image is then sold to the rest of the world as the Balkan way of life, as an idiosyncratic phenomenon that ought to be studied, much like chimps are studied by scientists and celebrated, much like we put sociopaths and clowns on a pedestal for the whole world to see. The packaging and consumption of Balkan has acquired the form of no less than a commodity, which should come as no surprise as late-stage capitalism has the tendency to commodify your very soul. Yet there's something peculiar about this particular case. Usually, the national identities and cultural stereotypes that are commodified and exported for the consumption of mesmerized foreigners have a strictly national or ethnic character. The stereotypical Russian, American, Frenchman, German, Italian or Spaniard are molded along clear-cut national lines. Yet as we go further east and south into the so-called Orient, things start to visibly change. The carefully curated national identities of former colonial powers, better known as the West, are clearly discernible from one another, whereas those of the Orient are often molded into a mystical cauldron of numerous ethnicities, peoples and cultures, which often have nothing to do with each other, as a fable made of caricatures, stereotypes and assumptions that, more often than not, are on the border of being outright racist and bigoted. These very caricatures of the filthy Arab living in desert caves, of the bug-eating, mindless Chinese drone and the poor, morally corrupt Latino criminal have historically served a very clear and unmistakable purpose for the imperial core, namely that of justifying and undermining the severity and brutality of Western colonialism and imperialism. It does make sense. If 90% of the world's population are portrayed as vaguely similar, filthy, uncivilized alien barbarians, what should possibly prevent you from, for example, invading their lands, plundering their national resources, dismantling their political and economic sovereignty, bombarding them with drones or poisoning them with depleted uranium and napalm? Exactly. Because all you want to do is broaden civil society to the east and teach the Orientals about democracy. These were the pretenses of the Nazi expansion towards the east, in conquest of Lebensraum that was to be taken from the savage Slavs, 
and its original inspiration, the Manifest Destiny expansionist project of the United States, but also the early colonial genocide of the euphemized Age of Discovery, where entire civilizations were wiped off of the face of the earth to make space for the white man. All these political projects had their foundation and public approval constructed on the myth of Orientalism, with all the mystification and dehumanization it necessitates. Suddenly, the pseudoscientific lies of so-called race theory became an official doctrine, where the melanin in your skin becomes your ultimate sentence. Just as the Nazis had their race theory that justified the Holocaust and assault on the Soviet Union, the liberal establishment has Orientalism that silently and subtly justifies all contemporary atrocities under the veneer of broadening civil society. The only difference being that the Nazis and fascists committed their crimes within the traditional imperial core of Europe, giving their actions more shock value for the Western world. But in reality, they weren't any more brutal than the endless list of atrocities committed by the West against the so-called Third World. At least the Nazis were honest with their agenda, unlike the neoliberal establishment which tries to shrug their inherent material links with fascism under the carpet, pathetically trying to shift attention and blame onto the projected myth of totalitarianism and the horseshoe theory which aimed to equate communism with fascism, while silently ignoring their own neatly branded race theory while relentlessly ravaging the Balkans and the rest of the capitalist periphery. Here with Balkan is nothing else but a further embodiment of this very phenomenon. A brand, a trademark, a symbol that has unfortunately been cultivated by its very inhabitants themselves. With the rise of the internet and social media, this commonly contemptuous portrayal of the East and Balkan in particular has now acquired increasing relevance. I'm gonna be honest, I find the memes and the jokes and stereotypes funny. They truly are. As a Balkan Slav, there's just something hilarious about laughing at these crazy stereotypes and caricatures. The difference being, however, is that I'm fully aware of the political utility of these images, and I'm trying to serve as an example of their practical absurdity. I mean, that is the purpose of this video and my content in general. To expose this mirage and show the world that there is and has been much more to this region and its inhabitants than mere bloodshed, barbarism, crime, pauperism, and violence, that these images do not justify our place in the grand scheme of things, as the colonized servants of the Uba mansion from the West, that we are and have been more than capable of taking care of ourselves without violence and Western intervention. The Balkan brand is essentially a collection of many intricately connected characteristics and traits that reciprocally complement each other. However, keep in mind that these stereotypes don't by any means apply to every Balkan person, of course, but are simply a set of traits that embody this phenomenon. One of the most obvious traits promoted in this whole culture would be the sense of hypermasculinity and militaristic norms imposed on the general male population. This fetishization of military service, of the glory in fighting for one's country, of being a strong-handed macho man who is the head of the house and is responsible for protecting the country from enemies, is intricately connected to the patriarchal system that lies at the very foundation of our society. It promotes traditional gender roles and patriarchal domination over women, which grounds itself in blatantly open and non-controversial misogyny and sexism, especially in more rural areas but also undisguised rape culture and untrammeled male promiscuity that is seen as a measure of success of the archetypal macho stud. Svaki muškarac ženu gleda kao seksualni objekt prvenstveno. Tako da ako naletiš na neku budalu koja je u tom trenutku pijana, drogirana, a ti ideš takva ulicom sama, znači ti si isto kriva. Ti... Drugo je krivično delo kad ti, kad ti dođeš kod neku kući u 12 uveče i onda kažeš da te zlostavio, ti si došla sama od sebe tamo. Znači, to nije baš toliko krivično delo, jer si znala zašto si došla tu. 
toga mu se šalješ... Jer čak i tvoja devojka može da kaže ne u nekom trenutku i to treba da se poštuje. Nema tu ne, gledaj ovako. Kako nema ne? Šta nema ne? Ovako, šalješ gole slike muškarcu. Se naći u toj situaciji, užio sam muškarcem koji je pijan, doći ćeš kod njega kući i nemoj to da pričaš što si sad meni rekla. Pošto možda neko možda ti izbaci ovako kroz prozor. Znači, to sve što pričaš ti to zadrži za sebe ako si pametna. Ti misliš da si pametna ako si takva, nisi. Ti treba muškarcu kaješ, jeste, sve si ti u pravu. I on kaže, znaš. Ja se izvinjavam. E, to treba da uradiš, a je tako. Ja se izvinjavam, izađe napolje i niko neće te dira. Razumeš? Every guy ought to see himself as a Pablo Escobar, as a zajeban lik who knows people, has connections, and will fuck you up if you touch his gang, who has a hot temperament and lives fast, recreationally does drugs, is an expert at sports betting, and has to do some shady business to bring food to the table, because jebiga to ti je Balkan. However, if you have tough luck in that same Balkan, your next station is Germany or Austria, where you become Gastarbeiter and Auslander, who breaks his back for a German slave owner to come back to his village with euros in his pockets and his ass seated in an expensive BMW, and then proceed to fire up Viseris Blata and Auslander on loudspeakers, or Buba Corelli listing the names of his favorite brands so everyone can hear just how badass you are. If not, then consider becoming a die-hard navijač or football fan of your local football club and enjoy your new company of violent hooligans who fight against the system by recreationally fist-fighting policemen, yet simultaneously serve as the main instruments of that same system and its organized crime networks. So to be a successful one of these, compassion and empathy can stand in the way of your ego, since you are the man, and any deviation from this norm is considered degenerate and weak, much like the strictly shunned and denounced LGBTQ community, which is apparently testament to Western pink imperialism, which aims to feminize our men and turn them into useless liberal pussies who can't fend for themselves, their country, or family. Ironically enough, proponents of this very mentality are the ones who are directly responsible for the existing material conditions and societal decay that they so passionately criticize. They are the ones who are truly weak and useless in the face of class struggle against the domestic oligarchy and struggle against foreign imperialism, as Balkan men have largely traded their class consciousness for a limited patriarchal dominance and surface-level spectacle, desperately following the steps of the petty bourgeois. The solution that is offered to all social ills boils down to conservative and often regressive calls for more tradition, more strictness, more masculinity, essentially adding to the wound the poison that had created it in the first place. Oh, we should bring back Dushan's empire is another one of those insane propositions that are becoming increasingly mainstream in the growing monarchist movement followed by the unironic, ludicrous calls to return the 14th century law code of Emperor Dusan Silni in Serbia. Yes, some people truly think that monarchism is the solution in the 21st century. While the Serbian royal family chills in England and the Serbian king is incapable of uttering a single word in the Serbian language. A stereotypical mascot of this mentality would be the internet superstar Miroljub Petrović, who is frankly not taken seriously by many, but still embodies the reactionary, backward mentality of a great deal of men in modern-day Balkans. The more fundamentalist and conservative your worldview is, and preferably the bolder your head, the more badass you are, the heavier your hand and sturdier your voice, rounding off the perfect muškarac. Religious fundamentalism is an aspect of this whole phenomenon that is at the same time sensible, but also completely contradictory to the promiscuous, criminal and violent behavior that is promoted by the same stroke. Just as pretty much everything in reactionary politics, all of it's riddled with contradictions and irony. But how can we possibly forget the main stereotypical Balkan trait? Fanatical, ethnonationalism, chauvinism and preferably fascism. All of these ideologies are, in the view of their proponents, the perfect embodiment of the above-described hypermasculinity and the true realization of proper values. Hatred of your neighbors along ethnic and religious lines is normalized and preferable if you fancy yourself a candidate for becoming a true Balkan persona. Just fanatically attach religious and national symbolism in your home, 
car, social media, and preferably on your skin, just for good measure, to properly show off your devotion. This sacred image of the crazy balconier is massively consumed in the West as a spectacle to behold, as chimps in a lab who write diss tracks against each other during civil war, who cynically laugh at each other's suffering, and are all Pablo Escobar types in their own regard. The Balkans, the powder keg of Europe, are therefore presented as the perfect example of oriental barbarism, while providing entertainment to the rest of the world, which, in some cases, even tries to mimic this behavior, in an attempt to be as badass as those natural lunatics from the Balkans. In essence, the society of the spectacle has assigned the Balkans the role of a European gladiator arena, whose eruptions and bloodshed are to entertain the whole world, while it suffocates in its own blood. Directly or indirectly, average people are increasingly appropriating and embodying this Balkan stereotype, one of the very few things that are universal and commonly embraced throughout the entire peninsula. Another question for... No, 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 now you wait for one minute because... Uh, uh... Croat Ustasha Terror. Uh, it's a compliment when it comes from you. I just realized that you, here in front of you, you have three representatives from the Balkans. I rest my case. I protest Slovenia. Every Slovene racist will tell you Slovenia is Central Europe, not Balkan. <laughs> but uh, it's my this old... This is Europe. Yeah, but you this know is what's Europe for so us. nice, and here you will agree with me, how... You know... I'm sorry if I repeat my old joke, but it's so true about the divisions of Europe that you said. You know, this is the Slovene nationalism. We are Middle Europa, Croatia, Balkan begins. Croats will tell you, no, we are still Europe, Serb Orthodoxy is Balkan. Serb will tell you, no, we are Christianity, Europe, uh, uh, Albanians are. Really so Balkan. actually only Yanis is from the Balkans. Yeah, yeah. But then you oh, go the uh, other way. Our ultra-nationals yeah. refuse that, that Austrians, that Austrians so. will tell you, no, Slavs are Balkan, we are civilization. Germans will tell you, no, Austria, Hungarian, Empire, already barbarian. French will tell you, there is something dark barbarian about Germany. And finally, I prefer the British position. All Europe is big Balkan with Brussels, New Constantinople, <laughs> and... We are the only, and uh, unfortunately, let me, let me add to this. This classic joke of Slavoj Žižek, I think, perfectly reflects the disdain and shame that this image of the Balkans elicits in the minds of foreigners and its own inhabitants alike. Usually, the dismissal of the Balkan burden is elicited in favor of an idealized European or fetishized regressive heritage, both of whom attempt to elevate the given group above this caricature. However, this is, more often than not, done in a dishonest, chauvinistic manner that aims to degrade and insult everyone else and elevate said nation to a metaphysical purity rooted in its mysticized past. Considering these tendencies, it should not come as a surprise that fascist elements from the region have relentlessly tried to construct a mythological purity from this rubble of Slavic degeneracy. The creation Ustashe the notorious Nazi puppets from World War II, have attempted to promote a pseudo-Gothic theory of origin, while rejecting the impurity of these orthodox Untermenschen to their east and embracing an idealized Germanic origin. You see, while being Slavs themselves, Croatian fascists have herewith solidified their desperate need to feel more European, to be part of civilization, and to conform with the universal Nazi race doctrine. Moreover, the average modern, liberal, or nationalist Croatian and Slovenian will, in the same manner, wholeheartedly embrace this civilizational quality of Western and Germanic culture as his own, while rejecting the dark, barbaric orientalism of Serbs, Albanians, and Bulgarians. When it comes to the Serbs, there is a paradoxical struggle in this denial, where the fascist and chauvinist camp rejects Europe and the West as being barbaric terrorists, who aim to degenerate and westernize Serbian culture, while embracing metaphysical ties to Russians and the East, 
and paradoxically promoting an autochthonous theory of origin, how Serbs are the true natives of the peninsula and have nothing in common with the rest of the Slavs. On the other hand, there's the liberal camp, which, similarly to the Slovenians and Croatians, embraces the European Union and NATO as the savior and civilizing factor to the otherwise uncivilized Balkans. Then we have the Albanian ethno-nationalist and fascist narrative, which equally embraces this autochthonous mythology and bases their political and racial supremacy in these very claims. The Greek reactionaries, on the other hand, like to reject Slavic and Turkish barbarism alike and embrace this ancient Hellenic ideal. The Macedonian ones have conjured up their own nationalist mythology that aggravates both their Greek and Bulgarian counterparts, whereas the Bulgarian fascists love to swim in the sea of nostalgic, idealized past while openly showing disdain towards the Roma population or so-called gypsies, something they have in common with all their ideological twins to the east. As irony and paradox are the main components of Balkan affairs, all of these reactionary elements are desperately fetishizing non-existent ideals, while ironically being the perfect embodiment of the very decay they're so repulsed by. So, what is to be done? How do we dispense from these externally and internally imposed archetypes without indulging in fruitless romanticization of such pathetic ideals? Is there any emancipatory potential in this whole discussion? If so, where does it lie? Well, to answer this question, we must look at the scope of this phenomenon. This all-encompassing Balkan prototype is exactly that, all-encompassing. In its general presentation, it knows no borders or nationalities, as everyone is lumped together into one big oriental vukoyebina that shares the same burden. At first glance, this may seem depressing more than anything, but this is exactly where I see revolutionary potential. As much as this phenomenon is harmful and degrading, it simultaneously provides a weird sense of unity and oneness that paradoxically arises from the many individual attempts to appear unique and superior. Arisen from these very irreconcilable differences, the phenomenon provides a relatable common burden, a common struggle and a common shame. I think that the common denominator is more than obvious here. Since our reactionary forces are guided by the same principles and axioms, with barely different aesthetics, the progressive response has the potential of being unified and unanimous, if we play our cards right. So let's be real, the Balkan brand is here to stay whether we like it or not. We are stuck with the label and the geographical and cultural chains of our heritage. Yet, despite the sectarian and exceptionalist character of the enjoyers and endorsers of this image, the confines of this rusty shell can be used to our own advantage. The trending Balkan identity can be usefully utilized and used for revolutionary ends, as a common burden that unites progressive forces of the region and seeks to emancipate the marauding tribes. And this is exactly the reason why I named the channel Balkan Odyssey to dispel the stereotypes, expose the spectacle, and cleanse the word Balkan of its negative connotations. Since late-stage capitalism has succeeded in branding and commodifying even non-material phenomena, it's up to us to acknowledge their significance and use it to our own advantage. So consider this project as a rebranding of this notorious label and its revolutionary transformation into something healthy and novel first in theory and in the mind of the average person, and then, hopefully, in practice.